The year is 1930, and a certain writer named Mikhail Bulgakov just finished writing his new novel. He worked hard on it for months, even years, and here finally it laid before him, a complete manuscript. He had thoughts of publishing it, making some nice money off of it, and gathering a good amount of fame. All it would take is to bring it to a publisher, and there he goes, his dream come true. Everything seems to be going good, right? Right? Except he lived in a Soviet Union at the height of Stalin's paranoid purges, his neighbors kept disappearing, secret police was everywhere and the gulags were sharpening their eyes cold teeth. And so he realized that if that book was even found in his apartment, that he was totally, utterly fucked. So he took that manuscript and threw it into the fire and tried to forget about this bygone masterpiece. It seemed like it was the end. But was it though? It's me, Ben the Horseman. And this is the story of what happened when the devil visited Russia. The book The Master and Margarita starts with two Moscovite intellectuals, Ivan Nikolaevich and Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz. Ivan recently wrote a poem which Mikhail edited for the issue of his anti-religious journal. Mikhail had a certain issue with it, however, namely that Ivan portrayed the main character, that is, Jesus, in a negative light, sure, nevertheless, it made it look as if he existed. He tries to convince him therefore that Jesus was nothing but a myth and that the poem should be discarded and rewritten from scratch. During their conversation, it becomes clear that Berlioz's criticism is purely ideological and has nothing to do with the creation process itself. Ivan wrote an original and authentic poem with a vivid character that he brought to life with his pen. However, because it did not align with the Soviet ideology, it had to be discarded. Such confirmity, the author implies, leads to the creation of often dull and inauthentic art. Although you gotta admit, Soviet music rocked. Damn, almost makes me want to believe that communism could work. Except it never will. As the two men have their conversation, a foreigner approaches them, whose name later in the novel turns out to be Wallant. He seems to ridicule Berlioz's rejection of Jesus and God, even telling him the first-hand account of some of the events from the Gospel. Then proceeds to tell him that he won't make it to his meeting tonight, and that he will be decapitated by a woman. Berlioz and Ivan, throughout this encounter, are completely paranoid about encountering and talking with a person from another country. They even consider turning him in to authorities. Hmm. Kind of a douche this Berlioz, isn't he? Telling a young writer to discard his work, doesn't treat a stranger with kindness, and on top of that, he's a snitch. Therefore, I think you'll be glad to hear that soon afterward, he falls under a tram driven by a woman. The inside joke of Mikhail Bulgakov here is that a person who claimed that Jesus was never alive ceases to be alive himself, therefore finishing his indirect mockery of Soviet censorship and their ideological intrusion into the world of art. Now let's discuss the character of Wolland, or the devil himself. Although he's explicitly stated to be the Satan, he isn't portrayed as the straightforward evil dude, nor is he truly a villain in this story. Although he and his gang, which consists of a giant cat, wreak havoc all around Moscow, at no point do they commit any violence nor truly evil acts. Their behavior is more like that of a prankster, a troll or a joker, rather than a pure embodiment of evil. Wallant is rather a complicated and the most interesting character in the novel, who's used by Mikhail Bulgakov to expose and ridicule the corruption and decadence of Soviet Union, whose government and its followers claimed to be able to build a perfect society devoid of the belief in God. For example, after the death of Berlioz, a man named Nikanor Ivanovich Bosoy is tasked with approving who will get to live in the newly vacant apartment of the deceased man. Wolland proceeds to offer him a large sum of money if he allows him to stay there for a week, a bribe that the loyal communist accepts with delight, only for that money to later turn magically into foreign currency, just as the police enters his apartment. And the possession of a foreign currency in the Soviet Union was illegal at the time. Mr. Bosoy, we would like to inform you that you want a free vacation to Solovetsky Island. <laughs> free vacation? Cool! Wait, what? 
However, Wolland's most interesting way of exposing the decadence of Soviet society is through art, which Bulgakov believed is the best way of revealing society's inner nature. In one instance, Wolland throws a black magic seance in a theater and makes it rain money, which causes everyone present to fight over it. In another instance, he puts up a fashion boutique on stage and a wave of women causes a stampede to grab as much of the free stuff as possible. In these two situations, the devil exposes this society's complete disregard for any moral rules and their mindless submission to their worst instincts. By trying to create a perfect society without the moral laws characteristics of religious beliefs, Soviet government has created a crowd who only care about materialistic possessions. Another great writer, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, wrote about it too. The Soviet government would imprison genuinely good people simply because they said something mildly critical of the regime, but murderers, thieves and prostitutes, although criminals, were considered as the class allies who simply had to be reformed and would often get shorter sentences. Another thing which Wolland exposes in the Soviet society is the people's cowardice, which Mikhail Bulgakov argued was the worst sin of them all, one which leads to all the other sins. He does so by ridiculing Berlioz's disapproval of Ivan's poem on Jesus through the character of Wolland. Not that the devil wants them to be good religious people, but he wants to expose to them the fact that the Soviet intellectuals don't care about the authentic and wholesome work, instead they conform to whatever the state tells them to write about, and in exchange they get to enjoy expensive dinners and lavish apartments. People like Berlioz are basically cowards who are afraid of losing their comfort and choose to sacrifice truth and free will for the sake of it. And because of that cowardly submission, the tyrannical rule can flourish. If art and its ability to show the reality of society was the main theme of the first half of the book, the second half's theme is that of love. You see, after Berlioz got wrecked, the young Ivan began to chase after Wolland all over Moscow and eventually ended up going into a slavish banquet attended by all major intellectuals in which he tries to explain to everyone that he was chasing after a man who predicted Berlioz's death and that he was accompanied by a large talking cat. It doesn't end well as you expect, Ivan ends up in a psychic ward and one night gets visited by one of the fellow inmates, the man who simply referred to as the master and he tells Ivan the story of his love for a woman who is mentioned simply as Margarita. But bro, th those are the names from the title, <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, chill, chill, chill. We'll come back to this later in the video. Master was an ambitious writer who wrote a novel about Pontus Pilate, a Roman governor. By chance, he met Margarita and immediately fell in love. She turned out to be a very supportive lover, and when Master's novel was rejected by the publisher, she tried to convince him to keep the manuscript and not give up on it. However, Master grew paranoid and scared of the possibility of Soviet authorities coming at night to arrest him for it. He decides to burn the book and admit himself to the psychiatric ward, thinking that it was better and safer for Margarita to live without him. So cute. You see, most of the minor characters in novel, like Mr. Bosoy that got bribed by Wolland, have spouses. Yet at no point do you see any love or care between them. They lie, they cheat, they manipulate each other, and they even snitch to the secret police on one another. Just like art was turned by the Soviet regime into a mere tool to spread their ideology, so were the relationships between individuals made into a kind of a materialistic business deal of sorts, devoid of any real love or affection. Margarita is struck by the disappearance of the master. She has no idea about his whereabouts, what might have happened to him or if he's still alive. Despite the uncertainty, Margarita makes every possible effort to find her love. Her quest brings her to a chance encounter with Wolland, who ultimately helps the couple to reunite. In the novel, the two characters who display caring, courage and honesty ultimately find happiness. On the other hand, those who are selfish, materialistic and cowardly are either ridiculed 
die in a pathetic manner or get arrested by the very regime they had submitted to. The title of the novel was changed multiple times, originally putting Wolin's visit to Russia at its center. Yet in the end, Mikhail wanted to put not Wolin's chaotic shenanigans at the heart of the story, but rather the love story of Master and Margarita, as well as the hope they possess even when separated. That love and hope, he thought, was the ultimate act of defiance in the face of a totalitarian regime, one that sought to destroy loyalty and trust between individuals and wreck people's souls. Unfortunately, Mikhail himself never witnessed the publishing of his novel. Having died in 1940, while nobody thought Stalin's oppression was going to stop anytime soon, and manuscript of the master Margarita stayed in his drawer for a long time after its author's demise. However, as if by some miracle, the book finally made its way to the public in 1967. It was first published in Paris for the Western audience and gradually became available in Mikhail's home country. Two more decades later, the Soviet Empire collapsed and Mikhail became a celebrated Russian author. That hope and love for the craft is what ultimately won, not the lies or tyranny of an oppressive regime. As Wolland says at one point in the novel, Manuscripts don't burn. Or as another great Russian writer, Fyodor Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. Video on that coming soon. And if you want to learn more about this, then click on this video right here. Consider subscribing if you like my content. And as always, keep your balls full and your stomach empty.